Oh, well, kia ora koutou. Um, I am beaming in from Kuku. Um, uh, thank you very much for this opportunity today. Uh, but what I really want to talk about was just a series of things that Nigel had um, set up for us to kind of talk about. So I've tried to organise my, um, my talk um, from the larger to the more local and that um, I will be taking you through a series of slides and, and talking about them as I go through. And so, Scarred Nations, thank you. And I, as Nigel was saying, um, I am from Ngāti Tupuri and Ngāti Rākua Kitatonga. We're also affiliated with Waikato as Kingite, Storch Kingites, um, in relation to um, Brett, so Mihi Mahana Ki Apoe E Te Tananga. Um, I do a lot of work in uh, large-scale environmental projects, so uh, I have used um, art and visual systems to help bring our people um, on board with the work that we've been doing and particularly over the last um, 22 years. Um, I think I probably started this work in 1995, but the physical action of rehabilitating wetlands and stream systems um, began about 22 years ago. So what I show you here is a view from our, um, our Paimonga, our, um, our um, Otararere and uh, the Oho River flowing out to sea. And then you also see the area of the Oho River um, and it's um, the coast bank owned by by, owned by the tribe. Um, also, you see in the mountain view, there's also um, cadastrals and lands that are still in Māori land title. So a lot of the work that we do is based around those areas that are still in Māori land tenure. So if we look at this image um, about um, the coastal area, um, why I show you all this is because I'm quite, um, it's like fighting a war against the impacts of, um, of power of economies, of, of extractive industries, of capitalism, of where we find ourselves um, contemporaneously in this world, where we are dealing with the, um, the difficulties and the difficult histories, we're um, negotiating difficult histories, but we're also dealing with the contemporary impact of what happens in the combination of those um, uh, dominant forms of, um, of being and, and those human endeavours that have actually put us in peril. So I, I kind of stepped away, about 2004 I left the dealer gallery system and I kind of stepped away from the notion of making individual artworks and then put my energy into creating more large scale um, projects which were action oriented for returning natural integrity or returning the knowledge from Mataranga, the Kaupapa, of Te Thayel back to our whenua, especially where it's held in Māori Land title. If we get the Māori land revegetated and looking um, and being well again, and our people being well again, well then those effects flow on to the rest of the community. Uh, we use a lot of visual systems, so uh, mapping is quite a big thing amongst our team, so I'm always employing um, really um, significantly onto it um, sophisticated mapping technologies, but we're, we're basing a lot of our work on the historical and being able to um, um, put those into um, maps that are of use for a contemporary um, contemporary um, point of view. Uh, so the previous map you saw was a climbing map done in 1879, and he was in, he was um, uh, in earnest working in this area. And the thing I love about these old photos as well is you can see where the wetlands were and the peatlands, and you can see where the forest cover was, and then you can see what we've um, what we've become as far as a um, a denuded country. The kind of work of Plymy gets kind of fashioned into these maps as well, which are also kind of symbols as dominance and, and, and control, as Tom was um, so um, well, has he put, well, put so well in his previous conversation. But these impacts of cadastralisation and how that um, um, uh, management of control over Māori lands was the beginning of um, the, the erosion of the intricate relationships that Māori had with each other, their hapū, their whānau, but also with their land holdings and the resources and the natural environment that was in those land holdings. So when you start straight lining and cadastralising and private property and individual title and beginning that bureaucratic complex as a tenurial revolution to the way Māori saw uh, land as their identity and their sense of well-being, you start the beginning of those, um, those battles and those difficulties for Iwi and Hapu. But just quickly, um, research underway. I am, all, there are always projects that have been dovetailed from previous projects that we've done before. 
I have done a good decade uh, to 20 years of intensive research, and then this is the kind of research we're looking at at the moment. Return the harakeke industry back to whenua as a, um, as a healing uh, remediation to the troubles that we face in regards to um, uh, impacts of climate change, um, increased flooding, um, storm surges, all sorts of other um, unpredictable weather events. So working with um, esteemed people like Drs Rangitikanua, Faith Kane, I work with Angela Kilford, um, another Māori leader in research around the dyes of harakeke, because we are very keen to get harakeke back into our whenua. I'm on more climate change research projects um, led by, or co-led with Professor Bruce Glavovich and myself and a, a postdoctoral fellow, Hilary Webb. Um, that's a uh, project that's living with uncertainty, um, complexity, plurality and contestation, and we're working with communities, um, Tangi Moana, Putiki Village, uh, Waitotara and uh, Waitara, or the Rohutu block in Waitara and Taranaki. Um, a lot of this work that we've done over time has given us a lot of information and a lot of research um, that we keep building upon, and I've been working with Zara Stanhope and her team about um, a three-year project where we've already had the first kind of year iteration, the Te Liquid Constituencies um, uh, research project and um, exhibition, and that will continue for another couple of years. Um, we've applied for Manitou to Manapai to Manamatanga about mobilising more sophisticated mapping technologies for the benefit of, benefit of our coastal farm. And also for, um, we're just finalising some questions for some more funding, which is to expand how we might um, uh, go to battle against greenhouse gas emissions for our tribal farm as well. Now I just one of the things of us to, um, uh, you know, what, how do we go about doing this? Um, so what I've, what I've kind of perfected over the years with the collaboratives that I work with is we've per perfected a method, like it's the hikoi walking and talking whenua method. That's the kore no tuku iho oral narratives me method. It's the memory of place and everyone's experience of place. And also it's the, um, the whakapapa, like understanding the intricacies and the intimacies and the inter interdependencies that come from um, understanding whakapapa and, and your relationships um, and all of those relationships that we have in the natural world. And then putting these into exhibitions um, that we've had in dairy sheds, on the tribe's farm, teaching our people about the complexities of climate change, um, harnessing art and design to help get those um, messages across. Um, and here are other ways that we've been doing it um, in the Dairy Shed exhibition as well, looking at scenarios. Um, so on the left, looking at Mātāranga Māori, and then on the right, looking at solutions to climate change. That was done in 2017. This went, an, an iteration went into the Dallas Art Museum as another way of disseminating the complexities um, via the art museum venue. And then um, I just kind of fly you back into Cuckoo, so um, a brainy photo of Stay Highway 1 in Cuckoo, doesn't look like that anymore. And I think you can see right in the middle, if you can see that, there is a cart, a little cart. And that's my great grandfather, Ramako um, Wehipei uh, Hanawa, his horse and cart. Um, um, and that was his road. It was originally his road, but was taken under the public consent, of course, for the state highway, and he never quite understood why that was so. Um, I'd fly you over to the land holdings where the Cuckoo Dairy Factory resides, and there's some early photos here. And the impact of um, power, the impact of um, ultimate authority, and the way that this um, enterprise was originally a Māori enterprise and then slowly over time its power base shifted and changed as more Pākehā farmers came into Cuckoo and um, in the 1930s particularly took over the power base. But um, the land around here was taken compulsory by the Crown um, as part of the war effort and, and it was, um, it was a, uh, under particular regulations, I'm just trying to find them at the moment, particular regulations the Emergency Regulations Continuance, oh sorry, the Emergency Regulations Act, um, and that was to give the uh, give government power to take land compulsorily, which is what they did. Um, twenty hectares or twenty acres around this um, dairy factory was taken, and um, never never returned, even when um, the notion to repeal that act uh, took place in 1947. 
Um, this is some research that I'm going to be doing with um, Sadat Kid, and, and he's been writing the kind of history of cuckoo, and I'll come in and just help him massage, um, making sure that the Kakapa Māori aspect of that research is, is fine as well. But the reason I show you these photos is because um, I'm just going to run my uh, mouse around this kind of perimeter. So this was the land that was compulsorily taken under extraordinary powers, exacted by the Crown, sorry, it was this area here, this area here, around that funny U-shaped piece of land, because Richard and I, my partner Richard and I, we bought that land in, um, in 2006. So you can see the dairy factory, you can see the development of these were the manager's houses. Um, there was a big um, veal store put up here in the 1960s. Yeah. And then what Richard and I have basically done is revegetate this um, 15 acres. And, um, and we now have a um, fully functioning olive grove, selling award winning olive oil. And we have <laughs> Oh, there's a little shameless hustling from <laughs> But I think one of the things I wanted to show you is just oh, yeah. the work that we do is all about healing the wounds that have happened to Fenua um, from, from um, the pillars of power um, and economy uh, because we've got systems happening which aren't doing anyone any favours. So very quickly, I'm just going to slide you through some... Um, the things that we're doing to try and ameliorate that. Um, we are doing biochar in a big way on our farm and I work with a, the, the biochar guru, Phil Stevens, in the hat here. He's also Mohawk, so um, he's bringing his um, indigenous and non-indigenous perspectives to this project, um, the biochar, the Kuku Biochar project. Um, we're a group of artists, uh, to watch Nuku, and we do considerable work together collapsing much of our intelligence um, over lots of wine and, and fine food, um, but really trying to find new ways and uh, new ways of representing our practice um, via collaboratives or collective in, um, efforts and then being able to um, um, show those in particular ways. So uh, quickly, just a biochar process for you, burning biochar, the olive prunings from our farm um, and then taking it through that cyclical process to end up with biochar, which is both a water filter and a soil conditioner. So the things about, um, you know, um, declaring war on climate change or declaring war on um, biodiversity loss or uh, poor water health or, um, you know, uh, starved soils and um, leaching and all sorts of other difficulties that humans have exacted on place. Um, we are using this as both a soil conditioner and a uh, water filter. Mm -hmm. And that's what's going to be happening um, for our stream system, and I'll show you in a minute. This was a biochar burn that we did at Parihaka as part of the To'o Liquid Constituencies um, exhibition. And uh, the kiln that was in that exhibition was gifted to um, Parihaka for the use in their māra pai so that they can be feeding people and healing people through the, um, the power of good food. And so just little flyovers again, um, just the, the Waikopuku stream you can see in the foreground there that's been revegetated. We started that in 2007. Um, the top olives, we call them the top olives, were planted in 2006. And you can see the stream system wending its way through here. Um, wending its way through here. Why is our olive grove called Waikopuku? Because of the name of that stream. And so we're coming to the point in 2023 when that stream is going to be healed by Tuwaitu Hianuku. So um, just in regards to exhibitions as research method, how to bring all that knowledge created into one place and how to disseminate that knowledge um, well to people, is that I do believe this group, as a group, um, also with our um, overseas members, we have perfected this way of disseminating complex information, complex research, difficult histories, um, impacts of colonisation in ways that is engaging and pulling people into the things that need to be done uh, for Fenner and Water. So this was the um, Kuku Biochar project for the um, uh, Waikopapu stream revitalisation. Um, the studio wall was all about the project, about how we're going to heal that water the uh, weed mat, the hemp weed mat that we uh, stenciled with biochar paint that we made, the YY pathwater pattern, which is the kukeko pattern, 
um, because we have lots of Pukeko in the Waikopupu stream, and then a, and then a triptych that was done by um, myself and um, Kieran Banks. So um, I'll show you the next one. And um, so that's just a close up. And the reason I, I've been doing these, this kind of work, like I do paint, that's what I normally do, but I've been doing a lot more stitching. I've been doing a lot more embroidery because I have a busy life and I have a busy life in regards to the work I have to do in my daytime job. And my downtime is to spend time embroidering. So I find it very meditative, very relaxing. Um, and this is what we, Kieran and I created for that exhibition, which is based on all the materiality of the Cuckoo Biochar project. So the coffee sacks for putting biochar in for filtering the waterway, um, the biochar itself, and then also the stitched components of water, the three waters, this one, um, but also <laughs> the impact that goats had on eating the ultimate colonizer, which is blackberry, and that I had to bring goats in to try and eat that back. But where um, in, in saying this work is all, all the whole installation was about healing water and, um, and uh, placing that weed mat on both sides of that stream system. And that work is going to be planted in July this year. Finally, um, I just, the other thing about being in Cuckoo is that Cuckoo has the best soil in the country. And so this is the kind of gardens we grow. Um, I, I'm going to say I'm not growing these gardens. Mine are up in the orchards, in the top orchards. And, um, and these are belong to the brothers Beveridge who, uh, who grow this incredible garden. So none of us, and very many of us in the local area, don't buy vegetables. We grow vegetables. So another aspect of healing the impact of um, difficult systems and difficult histories. Um, and finally, Finally, Richard, just one moment, I'm nearly done with um, that. Finally, links <laughs> to um, some of the work that we've done over time. Um,